Hello, my name is Greg Wallace. And I'm Mario Guerrero. And we're going to be continuing with the heat transfer uh, uh, lessons that I've been doing. Yeah. So, just as a reminder, the three methods of heat transfer are conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is through a solid, convection is through air or any fluid, and radiation is light. So, I thought we'd start off with an example of conduction and a little bit of convection just to uh, demonstrate how it's used properly. So to start off with, um, temperature change of a body, change in temperature is based on the Q, the, um, the heat, how much heat is added or removed in joules, and the specific heat capacity in joules per kilogram Kelvin, you can also use kilojoules or whatever, just make sure you're going to work out and the mass. Uh, and then for linear conduction, so um, going through a surface of um, constant area, uh, constant cross-sectional area, I should say, um, uh, heat uh, transfer rate is equal to uh, negative Ka change in temperature over distance. K being the thermal conductivity and area, and A being the area. And then convection uh, is H times A times the change in temperature, where H is the uh, heat transfer coefficient. Uh, that's uh, just a convection coefficient. Um, for these, we assume that the uh, K and the H and the area are constant, even though in a lot of real life examples that isn't necessarily the case. Um, especially for convection, so we got to be careful with that. Uh, take thermo, they'll start off just by saying, oh, okay, K or um, for convection, just use an H of say 20 watts per uh, square meter Kelvin or something like that. Um, but in reality, it's a lot more complicated trying to figure out which one you want to use. Um, units for conductivity, it's watts per meter Kelvin. And then for convection, it's watts per square meter kilowatt. And we'll get into calculating that in a moment. So let's start off with, you got yourself a nice house. And uh, you want to figure out heat losses in between your house, inside your house, and outside. So uh, let's start off with just a section of the wall. So we're just going to go with one of the walls for now. Um, to make it simple, we'll, we're just going to go with one square meter worth of wall and then you can just uh, literally extrapolate the rest of it. Um, so if I want to, if I took a, um, if I had two uh, thermocouples mounted to the wall on either side, and I measured the temperature outside and the temperature inside on both surfaces. And then I could just easily use this equation to figure out how much heat is passing through it. So, um, let's see the heat. Um, so, the K for wood, we will assume as, um, I wrote it down somewhere, 0.15 watts per meter Kelvin. And this is a solid homogeneous piece of wood, correct? Correct. And heat is only going through, straight through it. It's not going up and out of the sides. It's not going in from the sides or out or anything like that. It's all going straight through. Um, kind of assume that the heat transfer is linear, basically. Okay. Um, so that's the K area. Uh, I already said it was going one meter squared. If you really wanted to do over the whole thing and you're assuming that these were constant, you could uh, have the area over on this side and use you know, lowercase q dot, and that's uh, watts per meter squared. Um, but I'm just going to do it over one just for now. Um, and then say this is, um, let's say it's 10 centimeters of wood. So 0 0.1 meters. Um, in distance that the heat has to travel. 
and then say you measure a temperature difference of say 30, uh, 30, dif 30 degrees Celsius or 30 Kelvin difference. Um, since they're on the same scale, just offset, it's the same number. So if we calculate that real fast, 0.15 times 1 times 30 divided by 0.1, we get 45 watts. So that means that uh, for every square meter uh, wall, you have uh, 45 watts going through it. Um, I did not specify direction, so if your house is really hot and the outside is cold, then you would need to be supplying 45 watts of heat to keep your house at the same temperature. Um, whereas if it's very hot outside um, and it's cold inside and that heat is going through, coming inwards, then you would have to apply, supply 45 watts of cooling at whatever temperature you want to keep it cool at. Um, a, another point I'd like to make is that um, conduction is not always linear. It's not always treated as linear. So uh, for simple models, you can model it um, as linear as, I, as we've just been doing, as radial, as to say it is constant in any direction, um, sorry, uh, cylindrical, I should say. So maybe you have a pipe or something, or um, uh, or spherical. So you have a sphere, and it's radiating out spherically. So like you have a point, and he is uh, coming out through that. Um, I'll just talk about radial real fast, just to give an example. You can find the equations for these online. Um, so for radial or cylindrical, excuse me. Uh, we've got, I've got a, uh, right, the, use my cheat sheets. So cylindrical conduction, uh, Q dot, is uh, it ends up being 2 pi times k times the temperature difference divided by the natural log of r2 over r1. So that gives, if you have, uh, so you have a pipe and you know the inside surface temperature and the outside surface temperature R1 and R2. And you know the uh, thermal conductivity of the material and you know the temperature on both sides. And that's how you'd calculate the heat coming out. Now, let's, um, let's talk about a little bit more complicated of an example and how you'd solve for that. Say, Say we go back to our house. Nice house, pretty house. Uh, but instead of just having solid wood, you have um, a wall that has, uh, say, a layer of uh, wood just on the outside. And then on the inside, you have uh, some wood beams just for support, and then the rest of it is insulation. So, uh, let me draw it a little more there. If you're looking down, you have the outside wall, um, and then you have wood pieces as support, and then inside of that is fiberglass insulation. Um, you could have also just had all insulation, but you have this wood here as support. And so let's assume that uh, we can separate that, this into its own individual segments that are one uh, meter across. 
and one meter high. Uh, so I've drawn out one segment of that. I haven't I'm not quite. Um, let's uh, let's make this a little more square. That's more square. There we go. So uh, if we break that down into wood out, wood on the outside, uh, insulation, and then wood blocks. Um, so basically, what I'm doing is heat can come or heat can pass through through the insulation and then the outside block, or it can pass through the the uh, supporting wood blocks and then the outside blocks and then out. And we're also going to include convection on this example. So, problem, a problem comes in that we don't know the inside, uh, the temperature in between uh, the two sides of that piece of wood or the temperature between here and the inside. All we know realistically is the inside room temperature, the temperature of the air, and the outside air temperature. That's a lot more realistic of an example. So we need to somehow combine the convection coming in, uh, convection inside, the conduction uh, through two parallel uh, materials and then conduction through the outside wall and then convection outside again. So, one way they do that is what's known as a thermal resistance network. So, kind of like how I drew the heat exchangers in uh, my previous lecture, we will uh, use a symbol for resistor to uh, demonstrate just thermal resistance, basically. And the units aren't quite the same, but it's um, a good relationship. If you have high heat resistance, then it's hard for heat to get through something. So I'll just draw the network real fast. So you have the inside, inside room temperature, and then you have convection to the wall surface. And then you have, um, you have two different sections in the wall, um, an insulative layer and a structural layer. And so for that, you use two parallel resistances. Uh, and again, we're assuming that all heat flows straight through. There's no heat going up and in through there or anything like that. Um, so we're assuming that the temperature here is the same as the temperature there because it's on the same surface. Um, that's a bit of a simplification, simplification for most things. It's okay. And then we have the final layer of wood. And then we have convection again. So that creates a resistance network. Um, and so convection wood and the insulation, just the wood on the outside, and then convection. So you're creating a path that the heat would travel through. So how do we, uh, how do we actually do calculations off that? I'm going to miss this one real fast just so I can start uh, writing some more complicated stuff. So for conduction, uh, linear conduction, no, let's uh, step back a moment. We have, we're doing uh, thermal resistance networks. The equation that we use is, um, okay. how's that showing? That shows up just fine. Uh, heat transfer rate is the change in temperature over the resistance. So, if you look at any of these, you can see what items go in that R. So uh, for a conduction, linear conduction, we would take the X, the K, and the A. So in um, 
So for R conduction, that would be equal to X over KA. All right? And then for, uh, assume this is linear, because it's going to be different if, different if it's um, spherical or cylindrical again. Uh, so now convection is um, 1 over HA. Now we need a, a way to combine all these resistances, some of them conduction, some of them convection, and create a single R total. And then once we have that R total, we can very easily plug it in and figure out how much um, how much heat is escaping, basically. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just wondering how convection, um, you just know the H value for that? Is that just given on the most problem? Yeah, so um, lower level stuff, um, for classes they'll give you an H value. Um, eventually you're going to have to learn to calculate it based off the type of gas and how fast it's moving. And it is technically actually dependent on temperature. Got it. Um, Sometimes you can ignore that and assume it's constant, but it's a pain in the ass to calculate, so I'm not going to go over it. Um, you learn some ways to do it. Um, in general, uh, convection, you're going to be better off using some sort of computer model, because even with the decent um, uh, mathematical models you can do by hand, they're not that accurate. Like, you might be plus or minus 10% with like a really good one, so yeah. it, um, it kind of sucks. But, uh, with resistances, we can add them up as such. If it is parallel, that is to say something like this, where you'll have heat transferring the uh, same direction but through two different surfaces. And then R total, uh, 1 over R total is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus dot dot dot. dot. So you just sum the um, you just sum one over each of the resistances. Yeah. So in this case, I'll do one over connection through the wood uh, plus one over the connection of insulation, and then that will equal one over RT or the total resistance. Um, so it's a fairly easy uh, equation to do. And then if it's series, it's even easier. RT. R1 plus R2 plus dot dot dot. Um, yeah. So, what we've got then is everything we need to solve for this. So, I'll write out a few um, constants we're going to use. Let's see. So, let's assume the H of the air, or the um, heat transfer coefficient of the air. On both sides, realistically, it would be a little different on each side, but we're just gonna assume it's the same. 20 watts per uh, meter squared Kelvin. Now, the thermal conductivity of the wood. Uh, we're going to assume that as a point 0 0.15 again watts per meter Kelvin. And then uh, let's look at, uh, let's use fiberglass insulation. Uh, FG for fiberglass. It's probably not best, but 0 .00, 0 0.04 watts per meter Kelvin. So, let's, uh, let's calculate the heat transfers real fast. So I'll draw the resistance number one more time. Convection This isn't going to show up too well um, Yes, I'm not sure Yeah, that's right um, uh, Can you just point to the examples of the arrows? Yeah, we just have this one, that's fine um, so, uh, we're just in our arc convection. Um, since the area and the um, and the H are the same for both, we're just going to use a single one. Uh, let me see how green shows up. Now, wouldn't the area of the wood supporting piece be different? Uh, I'm assuming we're doing one square meter on both sides. 
Got so it. let me draw it again. Um, well, I should probably add some units to this. Um, so let's assume inside or inside temperature is 30 degrees C and outside is zero degrees C. Um, it is one meter long, um, and then this is going to be point. Uh, what did I write it as? Zero one meters, so one centimeter thick. And it's going to be point two meters, so twenty centimeters thick of insulation. I just make this a little more accurate. So this is the insulation. Uh, and then this distance is going to be 0. 0.25, or no, 0. 0.95 meters. So 95 centimeters, and then this one's going to be uh, 0. 0.05 meters. Uh, so now we have the dimensions uh, for the heat to go through. Uh, so, how's the green showing up? Badly. Uh, write that again, then. Take better care of uh, spacing this stuff. Uh, you can put it under parallel in series. Yeah. Uh, See if that's that kind of equation. Yeah. So, so outside is uh, zero degrees C. Inside is thirty degrees C. It's kind of chosen arbitrarily. So the whole thing. Or no, that is. Uh, 0.2 meters, so 20 centimeters thick um, that the heat has to go through. Uh, that is uh, 1 centimeter th thick, so 0 0.01 meters. Um, overall width is 1 meter, and then the height is also 1 meter, but I'm not showing that right now. Uh, then for the uh, wood structural parts, we're uh, going with uh, 0 0.05 meters, so 5 centimeters. That's kind of big, but and then the um, insulation insulation section can use uh, 0.95 meters long meters wide basically. Um, so our convection uh, that's per just one of these. It's one over H A. Surface area is one meter by one meter on both sides. One meter by one meter. Um, it doesn't matter which uh, material the convection is uh, going from because the material is uh, material properties all just goes into conduction. So we don't have to worry about which uh, material uh, we're convecting heat from. Um, so it's one over 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin times one meter squared squared. Um, that gives us um, 0 0.05 Kelvin per watt. So that's the, that is the unit for uh, convective resistance. Note that some do that um, per, per watt meter squared if they don't include the area here. Um, just note that you're going to see that in some formulas. For now, we're just going to do Kelvin per watt. Right, so we got one of them. Um, uh, conduct, let's look at the conduction through the outside section of wood. So that is the, uh, the thickness, which is um, 0.01 meters. 0.01 meters. Uh, divided by the area, which is uh, divided by the K times the area. The K is 0.15, and then the area is uh, 1 meter squared again. Uh, and then if you calculate that out, it becomes 0 0.067 about Kelvin per watt. So there's not too much of a difference between the two. Uh, that's not a lot of uh, resistance, so that means you're going to get a lot of heat going through it. Um, and then, 
Um, let's do the R of the. Let's do the wood uh, structural elements now. So, so our thickness is 0 0.2 meters. Uh, 0.15 is the same, watts per meter to Kelvin. And then the surface area is 0 0.05 times 1. So 0 0.05 meters squared. And so when you calculate that out, it turns out to be 26.6. Uh, uh, you might correct me if you run it yourself. Kelvin per watt. So that's a pretty big resistance. Um, but it's also a very much more narrow area uh, and it's a lot thicker it's a lot less area for the heat to get through but a lot more uh, distance the heat has to travel and then finally we can do resistance uh, through the insulation which gives us um, the same 0.2 2 meters um, this time the K is 0 0.04, and then the area, and this time it's quite large, uh, 0.95 times 1, so 0.95 meters squared. Uh, so, then when we break this equation down, we get the total resistance combined system is equal to uh, convection plus 1 over uh, 1 over R R of the wood um, this one plus 1 over R of the insulation and then plus the uh, outside wood. I'm not uh, identifying two woods too well, uh, but just bear with me and then the R convection again. And uh, so we can, I didn't get a number for this. This was um, 5.26. Now, even though the insulation is a better insulator in general, it has a lot more surface area than the wood, and that's why this insulation is uh, not as resistant to heat transfer as uh, the wood is. Um, that might confuse someone a little bit, but it's just because the area is so much bigger for the insulation. And if we had swapped them and made this wood and that insulation, uh, then it would be less resistance overall. Uh, but anyways, you plug all those in, and then you get a total resistance of, drum roll please, actually I'm going to start with uh, saying that this section comes out as 4.39 Kelvin per watt. And the significance of that is that our total is 4.6, uh, 4.56. So most of the resistance is coming from this section, just to point out. Just wanted to point that out. Um, so now, now we have the total resistance through the whole thing. Uh, 4.56 Kelvin per watt, and we can plug it back into this equation. So, heat transfer through it is the temp the uh, change in temperature from the inside to the outside, uh, 30, 30 Kelvin difference, divided by 4.56 Kelvin per watt. And then that is equal to 6.57 watts. And so that is how much heat is transferring from the inside of the room, the gas temperature, to the outside um, air temperature. So 
That's a lot better than the other one. Yes, so that is a lot better than um, trying to figure out the temperature uh, in between the spots. Now, if you do, now once you have this, then you can figure out what the temperature is at these other places just by um, taking the, uh, uh, by using these equations in reverse. So you know the heat transfer now, and you know the um, uh, transfer coefficient of air and the area, then you can find the change in temperature from there to air, there to there. And then you can use a uh, conduction equation to find the change in temperature from there to there, and then convection again from there to there. So you can then work backwards and figure out what the actual temperatures are. Um, now this is still not perfect because number one, we're assuming that this is steady state. So the fact that heat is coming through here does not change the temperature of the inside or the outside at all. Um, on if the, uh, yeah, so even though heat is leaving, it's not changing the temperature base. So um, it's steady state. Um, there's no real way to go from this um, to an accurate um, non-steady state. And we're also assuming uh, heat flows completely uh, axial. So uh, even though heat transfers better through the wood, um, we're assuming all heat goes straight through. We're not assuming that any of that heat comes in and then goes through the wood. Um, that's not necessarily accurate because if you uh, realistically heat would be flowing into the area that it flows into more easily. Um, so, but this is a very good start, and for a lot of things this is a good way to model it. Um, other downsides is radiation. Radiation transfers uh, not linearly with the temperature change, but by the power of four. So there's not really a good way to to make a uh, radiative resistance sort of thing. Um, so you can kind of do it at room temperature uh, if the temperatures aren't very different, um, but it's not as accurate. And it's, for most systems, they don't bother with it. But I'm just saying that because you will see equations for it. I'm just saying ignore it for now. Any, any questions on that? Um, now, is it? For the convection of the insulation, is that just air flowing within the insulation? Um, no, that's air flowing uh, uh, outside of the insulation. Oh. So this is this is the room. So oh, that's got, the room. Yeah, convection. so this is the room. Uh, because uh, you're not going to get a perfectly constant temperature in the air in the middle versus the actual surface. Got it. So this is the surface of the uh, of the room. And that's where we do the convection for the outside as well. Yes. And then, again, this is this is the wall here. So it's just convection to the outside. Um, yes. Yeah, so the importance there is that the surface temperature is not the same as the gas temperature. The overall gas temperature. Um, sometimes they call these uh, T infinity um, because the actual temperature um, uh, distance from the wall is say this is the, the wall temperature and this is the outside temperature the it's kind of a decay function toward that um, so you're assuming you're basically infinitely far because you never you know it approaches it but it never quite gets there one of those things so, um, but yeah so it's an important thing to note um, any other questions before i erase this stuff okay so That's it. I'm gonna also cylindrical conduction just because I don't care. Um, so leave that everything before we jump into radiation. Just check my notes. Um yeah. Um yeah, so uh, last time we mentioned that uh, if you have absolute zero, I'm destroying these markers. So 
uh, absolutely zero. Um, in Celsius, uh, that is at uh, negative 273K, whereas in Kelvin, that is at uh, zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin and uh, in Celsius, negative 273 Celsius. Um, and then room temperature, uh, I usually just assume it's 300 K. That's um, 27 Celsius. It's uh, maybe 76, 78 uh, Fahrenheit, something like that. So that's about room temperature. Um, now I mentioned that um, Producing heat is a lot easier than, or producing heating is a lot easier than producing cooling, um, just because of the second law of thermodynamics. Um, energy tends towards heat, and then it's hard to, uh, then you can't convert heat into energy without producing more heat than you just used, basically. Um, but just kind of an example to compare heating and cooling. And also look at two household appliances: the toaster and the refrigerator. So, you can buy a cheap toaster for maybe 15 bucks. And then maybe a cheap refrigerator for maybe 40 bucks. Um, it's mainly more expensive because the refrigerator requires uh, actual moving parts. You have to make a cycle to reduce cooling. Um, and now let's uh, compare on those what temperatures you can achieve away from uh, room temperature, about 30K. So for a refrigerator, you can get down to maybe, uh, what, did I, what did I guess, negative uh, 15C. So that is nowhere near negative 273. You're only off by like 40, 40 degrees. And then in Kelvin, it's what I write, 258K. So, you know, you're only about uh, 40 degrees difference, basically. And it costs you 40 bucks. Toaster, on the other hand, can, uh, can get up to Four or six hundred Celsius. Six hundred Celsius, which is uh, eight hundred seventy-three Kelvin. Um, so that is a pretty damn big difference, um, and it's a lot cheaper. It just goes to show that producing heating, a massive temperature difference, is easier than a producing cooling. That's pretty much all I want to say on that point. It's a good example of how the second law of thermodynamics applies in real life. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's a um, an example to help you kind of get the feel for it. Um, because being able to do the equations and understanding the equations are two different things. Um, you still need to understand the equations. Anyhow, uh, I think we can now move on to radiation. So, what is radiation? Um, radiation is um, transfer of heat through photons, and photons are um, electromagnetic uh, wave particles, basically. Um, they have properties of both waves and particles, and they have, because of that, you cannot classify them as a wave or as a particle. Um, they went through a lot of experiments, a lot of years, trying to determine is light a wave or is it a particle, and ultimately they realized it's neither, it just has properties of both. So um, there's not really a, there's no good comparison with um, other common uh, phenomena you see, unfortunately. Um, but um, one of the uh, properties of a particle that it does have is that it's quantized. That means you can 
um, you can narrow it down to a specific particle of sorts and say this is how much energy that single photon has. Uh, the importance of that is that you can be, uh, you can observe single photons um, if you want. You have, say, a really cold emitter and a detector. Um, you'll be waiting and waiting and waiting, and you won't get anything, and then all of a sudden you hit one photon, it's bang, something. And then nothing, and then nothing, and then nothing, and nothing, and then nothing, and then anything. And then bang, another photon hits. So it is quantized. You can, uh, it's not um, on the small sc scale, just a continuous process. Um, but on the large scale, it acts like a continuous process. So for the most part, we treat as that, as long as we understand that it doesn't, uh, that that is an approximation. Um, it's a good approximation on a large scale, uh, but it is an approximation. So, Uh, so radiation, uh, there's a spectrum of radiation uh, over what exists. So that is based on wavelength. And frequency. And uh, photon energy. Showing up. Yes. Uh, thankfully for light, um, all of these are dependent on each other, and you only need one of these three to be able to tell what the other th other two are. So if you know the wavelength, then there's only one frequency it could possibly be, and there's only one energy it could possibly be. Um, same for the other three. Um, so if I were to draw it, um, let me see. Let's go with uh, frequency. So frequency is in um, kind of a V, so it's a Greek symbol. Wavelength is uh, lambda. I think that's a lambda. And energy, uh, I don't see. Okay. Um, so wavelength is a. Uh, we have a low wavelength, and the frequency is high. And the energy is low. So this includes radio waves and microwaves and things like that. So they have very, very low uh, photon energies. And that's why um, a lot of, uh, that is why it is um, not generally accepted yet that radio waves are bad for us, even though, you know, they're going through everywhere. The problem is that they have such low energy that there's uh, it's questionable that they're actually damaging. Now, if you have a ton of them in one area, like a massive amount, uh, then what they're going to be doing is they're going to be transferring a lot of heat to the body, and then that can be dangerous because you know it heats up your cells and stuff. And that's how a microwave works. It's not that the um, individual photons are powerful; it's just that you've got so many of them coming in so fast that the heat it produces causes water to boil, and that's what actually kills them. It's the heating, not to the, uh, uh, not necessarily the energy themselves. Um, but if cell phone radiation does cause damage, and that's probably just because certain cells are absorbing it more than others and it's causing them to heat up. Um, now, I'm not a medical person, so I don't think any of this is gospel, but um, generally that's kind of what is expected. Uh, and then later on, you get um, you get infrared light. So I'll say radio. Um, infrared IR. Um, also, generally not considered uh, harmful. Um, can be um, again in very large amounts. You know, don't microwave your head. Duh. Uh, and then there's visible. Uh, this is light that uh, your body is, um, or that your eyes are able to detect. Um, it's a pretty narrow band, but interestingly, about half of the light that the sun produces is in the visible light spectrum. If you look at it in terms of how much energy 
is emitted by the sun, um, despite the fact that it's basically an infinite range uh, from uh, low frequency to high frequency. Um, just about half of the sun's energy. And that's just because it comes out in a kind of a bell curve sort of shape. Um, uh, then you get the UV, ultraviolet light, uh, and then then you have uh, X-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays. Um, um, and those one X-rays and gamma rays are particularly dangerous uh, because they have so much energy that they can knock an electron off of a uh, off of a chemical and so that's what's known as ionizing radiation and the problem is that when you have uh, ionized uh, chemicals in your body they can then um, uh, re uh, create a new chemical bond with something that it shouldn't have originally been bonded with so basically it's creating it's destroying chemical bonds and creating new ones and that's uh, that can be pretty dang harmful for you. Um, but again, since uh, we know how much energy they have, it's pretty much just in the X-ray and onward. Um, side note, supposedly X-rays are visible to the naked eye um, in large amounts. Um, supposedly they produce gray light, like a light gray light. Um, Someone lived to tell about it? Yeah, so in the early days of experimenting, they didn't know was, any of this was dangerous, and they're just like, oh, if you have an x ray beam and you know, look down at it, you know, it produces a light gray light. Um, it might just be the cells in your eye dying, I don't know. Um, but Because it's past it's UV, because. and UV isn't visible. Yeah, it's so. past X. Not visible. So would it just be the sheer energy of the waves themselves interacting with your eye cells? Possibly. Um, who knows, maybe there is actually some cells that can detect x-ray specifically. I'm not going to test it. Yeah, no um, I don't suggest testing it either, but if you do, write it down and make, <laughs> take really good notes. Um, now, UV light is what um, I'm always concerned about at the beach. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's not ionizing, but it still has enough energy that it can uh, make and break certain chemical bonds. Um, so that is why, in very large doses, it can be quite dangerous. For example, in uh, if you're in California, um, the uh, effects of sunlight, even with sunscreen, are um, uh, so high that if you were to uh, bottle up that sun or bottle up that uh, sunlight and sell it, you'd have to legally mark it as cancer causing. It's that it's, it's that bad, basically. Um, of course, now the days are also. Uh, required to label coffee as possible carcinogen, unfortunately. So, um, but yeah, so you know, visible is where it started getting pretty weak. It's probably not a problem, and then after it's very, very weak. So um, I'll just write uh, high wavelength, right. uh, low frequency. Low frequency. I think you might have swapped frequencies. I... yes, I... shoot. Uh, yeah, I screwed this up already. Oh, it's a bad start. We'll have to edit that part. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so high wavelengths. Uh, high wavelengths, because radio waves are very long. Um, low frequency, um, because they don't happen very often. Um, frequency is just one over the wavelength. Um, so that's that's how we relate those two. Energy is a uh, I don't remember the equation for that. Uh, I'm sure you can find one. And then low energy. So then we get here. Um, the wave length is very short. Um, that frequency is high. Uh, and then it's also has high energy, and that's what. Is damaging. Now, I'm not saying, oh, you know, put yourself in whatever radiation you want. Just, just, I'm not a doctor, so. Um, 
anyway, so basically you only need one of these to tell uh, what type of light something is. Now, how does, uh, how does light get emitted? Um, so the way that we're going to talk about this uh, is by having temperature. So any body that has temperature uh, emits light, and they emit um, a certain um, spectrum of it. Um, now, technically, any body um, will emit all wavelengths. It's just most of it is in certain areas, and some of it is too low to detect. So. Um, the way they mark, or the way they graph that is, um, let me see, wavelength and spectral density. And so that tail, this is basically just saying here's how much of it is coming out of these wavelengths. And so the curve will look something like that. Um, it's not quite a bell curve. Yeah, it's not quite a bell curve. It's a curve. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It's weird decay on it, too. Um, yeah. It decays, um, and then the actual shape depends on the temperature. So this is lower temperature. Uh, lower temperature, high temperature. Uh, it's all dependent on the uh, the temperature of the body. Um, which I also probably redraw it because the peaks are actually changed slightly. Um, and the peak uh, actually uh, moves uh, slightly higher into the wavelength spectrum as it gets colder. Something like that. Um, um, so they, uh, based on whatever temperature, they'll say that's how much of these wavelengths it puts out. Um, so if you want to find the actual amount between two wavelengths, then you just find the area under this curve, basically, between that section. Uh, that's just a calculus thing. Um, so the sun, for example, say it's this one, um, you know, half of the, even though this goes off to infinity, uh, and you're emitting small amounts of whatever, infinitely high in theory, um, half of the energy is within the visible light spectrum. And that's just because we evolved so that our eyes could see most of the light. Um, we don't see all light, or we don't, you know, we could increase that by having extra cells for infrared and whatnot. Some animals would think they have that, um, but we don't. Um, apparently it wasn't uh, that important evolutionary, evolutionarily, um, or it just never developed for humans. So, um, if we assume that light is being emitted exactly as one of those curves, um, there is a simplified model of uh, emission and absorption called black body radiation. Uh, so this assumes that it's uh, it emits perfectly in that curve, perfectly under that curve. Um, ideal wavelength uh, emittance slash absorption. Uh, emit is just when you're having energy leave the system and absorption is the energy that hits it. Now in real life, um, uh, bodies tend to be made out of chemicals. Who would have thought? And um, some, some of those chemicals tend to absorb and reflect light a little differently. And so because of that, you can have in a real system have a, say, a drop in one area where it, um, it doesn't absorb it or, or uh, emit it in that uh, certain range. And so in real life, uh, things tend to be a little more complicated. 
Um, maybe, uh, maybe there's a drop in some areas, but it won't go above that curve. Uh, now, it also has a, a directional independence. Uh, Directional independence, which means just if the light is, if the photon is coming in from this direction, it is just as likely to be absorbed as if it is coming from this direction. Sort of, which, um, er, it's not a good example because the black body is already absorbing everything, basically. Um, you could say it's emitting, say, you know, a watt per square meter or whatever in this direction. And then it's also emitting in this direction. Um, that's also a watt per square meter. And uh, if you have a surface here, um, although I honestly don't have the math behind it, but that's one of the things we need to um, check on. And so the equation for that, for heat transfer, uh, so emission, uh, well, let's see, let's see the blue again. I also don't know a ton about the directional independent stuff. I think the main thing is that the surface is uh, super duper flat, so, um, you know, if it's bumpy, then uh, certain ones are going to get, yeah. I don't know if we can need that part, honestly. I don't know enough about it to say. Um, for the most part, don't worry too much about it. Um, so, for emission of light, um, if you're just talking about the amount of energy produced, you don't want to worry about specific wave wavelengths or whatnot. Q dot is equal to um, a constant times the area times the temperature to the power of four. Uh, and uh, this is a, is a Stefan Boltzmann constant. And um, you can look this up, um, just one number. Um, make, make sure you're using the Stefan Boltzmann constant and not the Boltzmann constant, because that's a different thing. Um, I believe it is uh, 5.1 times 10 to the negative 8. Uh, Watts per meter squared, Kelvin to the four. Let me double check that. Yeah, so you can remember because it's five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> um, That's fine. Now, so you can uh, do math off that is how much it emits. And then when it comes to absorption, um, it's uh, just. Uh, Q, uh, energy absorption is energy to the uh, incoming uh, energy. So all of the energy that hits it gets absorbed. Uh, for black bodies, they're always in steady state, even though the temperature uh, can change. But basically, the temperature changes, it changes immediately anytime something strikes it, and then immediately begin. Um, so everything is absorbed by it, and then um, it that it's like it has no mass or no heat capacity. It changes temperatures immediately. So it absorbs energy and immediately emits it again. Um, so it's always in like steady state, basically. Um, in real life, it takes a little bit of time to re-emit stuff. Um, but there are, um, there's a couple Inaccuracies, inaccuracies in this that we can fix. So, um, first I'll say the reason we call it a black body is because all of the light that hits it is absorbed. So it doesn't reflect any light. So you don't see any light coming off of it. Um, um, or does it? It emits all, or it absorbs all light, but it also emits all light. So if it is hot enough, that it produces enough light in the visible spectrum, it does give off light, despite being a black body. Um, so the sun, for example, is considered a black body. 
because it is so hot that it's also emitting enough or emitting enough uh, visible light that we can see it. So that's just kind of a quirk in the way we need it. We call it black body because it doesn't reflect anything, it just absorbs everything, but then it also can emit visible light. So it's just a good thing to know. Um, and the more accurate models, um, if a photon of light hits a surface, oh god, these are dying on me. So there's three possibilities of that. Uh, of what happens if a photon of light strikes the surface. It can absorb it um, as uh, measured by absorbance. Um, it can um, reflect it. So it can come in and then reflect back off. Or it can transmit it, which is where light passes through it. So a glass, for example, light goes through it. Um, but the light has to do, or the photon of light has to do one of those three things three things. Um, so you can uh, write down as kind of a, its own equation. So absorbance is in the Greek letter alpha, lowercase, um, plus reflectance, or reflectivity, I think, in uh, rho, same same uh, symbol as density, and then transmittance, which is in tau, and the probability of those in one, because it has to do one of those three things. Um, for black body, um, absorbance is equal to one, transmittance is zero, and and uh, reflectivity is zero. Um, but in real life, um, some materials transmit light and some reflect light. Um, now we are going to simplify it by um, ignoring transmissivity and um, say that some of the light will actually be reflected. Uh, most of our, most of the things on our spacecraft are gonna do one of those two things. So, well, what we want is known as gray body radiation. Uh, gray body radiation, so still no transmittance, but we also have some ref reflectivity in that. Um, so this is still assuming that the wavelengths of light are um, being produced in a curve, it's just uh, a lower curve, basically. Uh, as long as you don't care about specific wavelengths of light, this is a pretty good approximation. Um, it assumes that the absorbance of each uh, individual wavelength is the same as another individual wavelength in terms of just the ratio of how much of it is absorbed versus reflected. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so with what would a white body be like on this spectrum? A white body? Yeah, so like an entirely... Um, everything is uh, reflected. It does not absorb anything. Okay. That's known as a white body. Um, I don't think, you think really it's like a mirror? Or? Yeah, basically a mirror. Um, generally, that's just a low-key gray body. Okay. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know if they... Do they use the term white body? I'm I don't sure. know. Okay. I, I haven't taken the class. We'll, we'll define it as white body. So that's just um, where uh, a white body will be if uh, that's one. Absorbance is zero, so temperature never changes. Um, and also, it basically then has to be um, at zero Kelvin because then it uh, doesn't emit any light. Oh. Uh, because otherwise, um, since it's not absorbing any energy, it's just going to just cool down because it's still still emitting light. Or, well, eh, if it stays the same temperature and it's not emitting anything, then I guess that's okay. So it doesn't have to be at zero Kelvin. Uh, but white would, a white it's body would be easier, easier to cool down if it's. Uh, 
not absorbing it. If you can, yeah, if you can still remove heat from it, which I'm not sure if you can, but I don't know. But, um, yeah, we can Thought talk more about this. Um, so, uh, so for a gray body, um, absorptivity is, um, It's less than one, but greater than zero. And reflectivity is also there. And then transmissivity is zero. It's fuck transmissivity. Um, so now we get a new equation. So uh, let's check, make sure this is legible, sort of. Um, I'll try to write more over here because it seems to actually be readable. So, uh, heat transfer is equal to um, a new uh, coefficient times uh, uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant times the area times the temperature and so forth. So, this is emissivity. Um, since, again, we're talking about emitted light, uh, emissivity. And for the most part, we assume steady state, which is that emissivity is equal to absorptivity. Um, if if you want to look at a specific wavelength, you actually break it down to wavelengths, then you assume it's equal for that wavelength. Um, other, if these are not equal, then um, let's see, you are in a transient state basically. So it's cooling down or heating up or something like that. For the most part, you assume that emissivity and absorptivity are the same, and then. Um, Absorptivity, uh, or the absorption uh, rate, is equal to the um, the uh, absorptance times the incident heat, uh, or the incident uh, uh, energy input from light, basically. Um, just remember that the rest of the light that hits it has to go somewhere. So, uh, so it, the reflectance of it is equal to um, reflectivity times the Q incident. Uh, because energy has to be conserved, so basically some of it goes and is absorbed and some of it is reflected. But the sum of these two is equal to the incident of energy, basically. Okay, so there's just two things it can do. Uh, again, so you can just subtract one from the other to equal zero, correct? Yes, basically. Um, yeah, or you subtract uh, that from that and you get that. Uh, it's like any other equation. Yeah, it's like any other equation. Room, the heat has to go somewhere. How much energy is absorbed, how much energy is reflected is equal to the, how much actually hits it. Um, so now we can actually uh, use that for real substances. So you can look up the emissivity or absorptivity of most materials just online. Um, they usually assume it's at room temperature and that you just want the average. Or the, you're not caring about any specific wavelength, you just want in relation to how much heat is absorbed. Um, so, uh, I think we can then do some equations with that. So, let's say we have um, two surfaces, or two bodies, that are parallel to each other, and um, the area between them is uh, entirely reflective, so no heat goes into the upper water upper and lower areas. So all of the, all of the uh, heat energy goes uh, between the two. Um, you can determine a net heat flow between these two bodies um, by using this equation twice. So, um, let's say um, Q 
cue the net the net is that way. Um, let's say this body is at um, 300 Kelvin, this body is at um, 20 Kelvin. Liquid hydrogen temperature is really, really cool. Yeah. So, um, the flow rate then would be um, uh, QNET is equal to um, admittance of the 300K minus admittance of the 20K. Um, now, if we uh, let's just do one square meter as the area because we can. Seven Boltzmann constant is the same. Let's assume the emissivity of the two are the same. Um, that will give us uh, so we can figure out that is the um, difference in temperature. If uh, these are not all the same then you would use and you uh, just subtract them basically um, we're going to assume that the emissivity the um, uh, in the area are constant. Obviously, the Stefan Boltzmann constant has to be constant. Um, let's. Um, and that's the benefit of using the Kelvin scale since it's positive all the time. Yeah, so you got to. Uh, important thing to remember you have to use uh, an absolute scale for the temperature. So, Kelvin or in um, US unit, units Rankin, but Kelvin. No one cares about Rankin. Yeah. So. Um, Actually, now that I think about it, I'm not sure if the equations I wrote are perfect just because reflectance, but we're going to assume right now that they're all constant. Um, so let's, um, let's assume this is one black body up here. Um, and it's unitless, by the way. And then 5, 6, 7, and then negative 8 um, watts per meter squared, Kelvin 4. Uh, one meter squared, and then um, 300 to the power 4 minus 20 to the power 4. And now, if I uh, put that into my calculator, I'm going to start with the 20. 20 to the power 4 is um, uh, 160,000. Uh, 300 to the power of 4 is, um, let's see, it's a big number, 8.1 billion. It's a big number. Now, we are subtracting those numbers, so how important do you think this one is? Uh, not super important. Not important at all. So if it's for small numbers, um, it doesn't make a difference. It's going to be, it's basically still 8.1 billion. Um, so, go through that. Uh, 8.1 billion uh, multiplied by uh, 1 meter squared times 1 times 5.67 times 10 power negative 8 um, times 1, yada yada. Uh, we get about 460 watts. Now, that doesn't seem like a ton considering how big those differences were. Um, but when we go back to our second law and you see how difficult it is to produce cooling, that requires a lot of cooling to do. It is very hard to pull heat out from something that is at 20K. Um, and basically because of that, for cryogenic systems, you really need um, to try to decrease the radiation, which either means having um, solid insulation so that the only uh, heat transfer is through conduction and then just have really uh, low conduction uh, material, 
or um, having a whole bunch of basically reflective layers because every um, every uh, other layer you add in between this uh, cuts the um, amount of heat transfer down. So if you have um, one layer, then it decreases by a half. If you have two layers in there, it decreases by a third or by decreases to one-third of this. If you have four, then this goes down to a quarter of this, so about 100 and a little something watts. Um, that's assuming these bodies don't have any mass and they're just radiating heat um, through it. They're, they're immediately absorbing and radiating heat away. Um, yeah, so in uh, cryogenic systems, they generally have um, layers of um, reflective material with an insulative material between it, uh, aerogel or cryogel or something, and then layer another layer of reflective material, and then yada yada. And the important thing is you don't accidentally um, create conduction between the two outer layer, between two different layers, uh, because then you'll just go right around it and you just lost everything. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's still assuming linearity, of course, right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's a type of uh, it's a multi-layer insulation where you've got the uh, insulative material and then a reflective material. And it's, uh, uh, no, would a reflective material you know, benefit line. on both sides? Yeah, so it's reflective on both sides. Okay. Um, that just uh, means the um, absorptivity is low and the emissivity is, emissivity is also low. Would that hamper uh, the release of heat if we needed to do so? Yes. We wouldn't be able, we can't get heat through this quickly, basically. Okay. So that's an important thing to know. So multi-layer insulation is called MLI. Um, you'll find that in various places. Um, so, uh, so that's the basics of it. Um, then afterwards we can get into what I want you to try to do calculation-wise. Right. Um, did you have any questions on this? No, this is pretty straightforward, kind of like, uh, kind of like everything else we did. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is less complicated as far as the constants go. Mm -hmm. There's only one to remember. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. It has a catchy moniker. Hmm? Five, six, seven, eight. Oh, yeah. Something you can actually remember. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess one thing to remember no matter how cold something is, it is still radi radiating heat away as radiation. Um, it just doesn't radiate as much. So, um, get very cold and it starts to basically be unimportant. Or I should say, if you have a very different um, temperature than the lower one. 